Hey everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, and this year I was fortunate enough to be invited to the Paleo Rewind for 2021 with the Channel Edge, who organizes a lot of Paleo YouTubers into essentially splitting the year up into more digestible pieces rather than one massive year in review. And with that in mind, I actually chose to pick the first part of July as my main focus for what I'm going to discuss. And that's because there were some papers that I found really interesting, and if you follow the channel, the last one will be very on brand for me. And with all that said, let's get started. So the story of this first paper starts with a particle accelerator. And if you're not familiar with what a particle accelerator is, it's a giant tube many kilometers across in which particles are accelerated. And what this does is it releases a lot of different types of radiation and light rays off of these particles including some very, very fine-scale x-rays that can be used to image fossils. And honestly, this technology's been around for a while, and only now are fossils actually being imaged using it. Now the costs to use it have gone down, and that means researchers were able to put a fossil of Heterodontosaurus tuckeye into this machine, and they were actually able to image some very fine-scale ribs that weren't visible when they originally looked at the fossil. Heterodontosaurus was an ornithischian dinosaur, meaning it was related to things like Parasaurolophus and Triceratops, although not directly related. So it's very much its own thing, although still lets us know what some of the early Ornithischians may have been like. And these new ribs, which are actually gastralia, meaning belly ribs, may have actually helped us to understand how these animals would have breathed. And this seems a little bit strange to talk about how different animals breathe, but different animals do have different methods of it. For example, frogs use a buccal pump, which means they essentially pump air into their mouth and then into their lungs and then back out into their mouth and then back out their nose. And you can actually see this when some frogs are just sitting neutrally. Birds have air sacs, which they then expand and then pump that into the lungs and then refill the air sacs and then empty the lungs and then refill the lungs with that air sac. So they almost always have air inside their lungs. But these heterodontosaurus fossils show that there were some different muscle attachments on these gastralia, and that actually puts them very closely in common with us. Now, that's not in evolutionary terms. They are still very much dinosaurs, and we are still very much not dinosaurs. But these gastralia show that there would have been muscles running up and down these belly ribs of Heterodontosaurus. Meanwhile, in humans, we have muscles running up and down our ribs, which, when we take a deep breath, we can expand the chest cavity, and then let that chest cavity depress. And this is probably what Heterodontosaurus was doing. It was essentially using muscles on these belly ribs to physically expand the chest. And part of this is shown by the somewhat strange shape of many of these belly ribs, because this would have allowed them to stretch and pivot a little bit in relative position to one another. And that would have expanded the chest cavity so that these animals could breathe. So it's not identical to the system that humans have, but it is pretty similar, which is actually interesting because the later ornithischians took an entirely different approach to breathing, at least as far as we can tell. In fact, some of the differences, at least physically, can be pretty obvious because Heterodontosaurus had these gastralia going all the way down to the pelvis, so where the hips are. Meanwhile, it seems like later ornithischians lost these entirely and that these gastralia were not used in breathing in any way. Instead, it's much more likely that a muscle attached to part of the pelvis and then to the back of the lungs, and then contracting that muscle would expand the lungs and let air in, and then relaxing it would deflate so the animal could breathe out. So this paper is really cool because you're using subatomic particles generated by a massive particle accelerator to x-ray a fossil and understand how dinosaurs would have breathed, but also how their breathing evolved through time. Now, our next paper isn't about fossils at all, or at least it isn't directly about fossils. And that's because it's a climate study on the J-hole biota. And the J-hole biota is from the Yixian and Jiufutang formations of China. And it contains many, many feathered dinosaurs, but also mammals preserved with fur. And some of these dinosaurs include things like Microraptor and Cetacosaurus, but also the large fluffy Tyrannosaur, Ute Tyrannus which was preserved with three different specimens, all of which had at least some kind of downy feather on them. In general, though, large animals don't have as much hair, and we can see this in places like Africa, where you have things like the large rhinoceros and elephants, which really don't have fur, and so the same logic applies to dinosaurs having feathers for warmth. Although we also have woolly rhinos and woolly mammoths, which are related and we're living in colder environments. 
So was the J-hole biota colder? The answer from this paper seems to be yes. Now it's important to understand the J-hole biota comes from the early Cretaceous, when the planet was generally warmer. And so what researchers did is they looked at carbonate rocks, and carbonate just means it's some sort of ion attached to the polyatomic ion of carbonate. So CO3 with a negative two charge. And there's a lot of things that can attach to this. One of the most famous is calcium, which makes calcite, which is essentially limestone. But because of the oxygens present in this polyatomic ion of carbonate, you can actually get some good data for what the environment would have been like because oxygen comes in two different kinds of isotopes. So essentially at different temperatures, you'll have different concentrations of these two isotopes in proportion to one another. And by looking at the proportions present in the J-hole biota carbonates, they were actually able to see that it was pretty cold there. And so that means that the J-hole biota probably lived at very high altitude. And these are pretty significant altitudes. Based on the generally warmer temperatures in the rest of the world, but the cold temperatures here, the authors estimate that these animals were living between 2,800 meters in altitude and 4,100 meters in altitude. So that's about 9,100 feet high to about 13,000 feet high. So these animals may have been living in very, very high conditions. It essentially, they could have been in almost tundra-like conditions due to the elevation that was present in this environment. This then leads into the temperature estimates that these authors propose with an average temperature of about six degrees Celsius or about 43 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's year round. So the yearly temperature, including the summer, is still only 43 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty chilly where these animals were living. And that actually may have been the reason that they evolved feathers in the first place. Essentially, it helps to support the idea that feathers may have evolved simply for warmth. And now moving into the Permian, we're gonna be looking at Solurosaurus which if you're familiar with the show Primeval by the British Broadcasting Channel, you may actually know that they had a pet one in that show. And there's some differences, most notably the crest. And that's because these authors looked at the skull of Solurosaurus in more detail and found that the crest that it did have in the show wouldn't have been shaped quite like that. Instead, it would have been much more like a Triceratopsian skull where it would have been more flat and along the back rather than a single ridge down the middle. This study actually tells us a lot about the larger group that Solurosaurus actually belongs to, the Wegeltosaurids, all of which seem to have been gliders. At least Wegeltosaurus was and Solurosaurus was, as well as others that show evidence of this. So it's very likely they were gliding, and this is our first good look at the skull of one of these animals. And it shows some odd features. For example, it may not have had vomer bones at all and vomer bones are just one of the bones of the skull of many different animals. Another set of bones inside the skull of many animals is the pterygoids, and these were actually separated by a gap in Solurosaurus. These two features together gave it a wide gap in its mouth, in which it could probably fit larger prey, and I say prey specifically because the dentition and the large muscle connections that are caused by this gap in the mouth probably helped it to chew on very hard things, such as insect carapaces. Now, there's a chance it could have chewed on seeds or something, but based on what we know of its environment, it's far more likely that it was actually eating a lot of insects because exoskeletons can be really hard and Solurosaurus was the kind of reptile that seems like it would have eaten those things. And when I mentioned those large muscles, there were fossa, so essentially holes in the back of the skull where the muscles passed through that were incredibly large, at least relative to an animal its size. So it would have definitely had a very strong bite. So it could have been comparable to something like potentially a Tokei gecko today, which also has large jaw muscles and can definitely give you a pretty nasty bite if it does get a hold of you. Additionally, with the crest, they also suggest that it may have been used in some sort of display, but also it might have some defensive features because it may have been used somewhat like modern horned lizards do today. And essentially horned lizards have a lot of spikes along the back of their head that when they're provoked, they will tuck their head down and have those spikes point up in order to protect themselves. So potentially Solurosaurus was doing this. So this paper may actually help us to understand what the Wegeltosaurids were actually doing, which is gliding from tree to tree, munching on insects, and protecting themselves from larger predators. Of course, looking at a lot of other Wegeltosaurids is gonna be helpful for this. And these authors already mentioned that they are doing that. So hopefully in the next year, we'll get a lot more information on the Wegeltosaurids. As for animals that are entirely newly named this year, in the video for early June by Atasaur, there was a mention of the animal Phylax, which is known from a left dentary coming from Spain. And now there's another dinosaur known from a right dentary coming from Spain that's 
also closely related as a hadrosauroid. Not a hadrosaur, it's just closely related to the hadrosaurs. I'll get into that here in a moment. Portesaurus sospenati is the new one that was named in early July. And it actually plots very consistently with Aranosaurus, which comes from Africa, and Bolong, which comes from China. And this is really interesting because it plots with them incredibly, incredibly consistently. As in, in every single analysis that these authors did, it plots with those two other animals. This is really, really strange because while many authors run many, many analyses when they're doing these kinds of tests for where an animal is most likely to be related, it almost never shows up that they plot in just one place consistently 100% of the time. So it seems very distinctive that this was its own clade. In fact, it's so consistent that the authors do mention that Portosaurus may actually just be a fragmentary specimen of something like Aranosaurus or Bolong, but all these taxa are separated by millions of years, so it's not that likely. Hopefully we'll get some more fossils coming from Spain though, especially of these hadrosauroids that aren't quite hadrosaurs yet, so we can try and understand more about their evolution, and also so we can have something to talk about more than just jawbones. Another new animal is described though, coming from closer to where I live, near the Petrified Forest in Arizona. And this animal wasn't in the Petrified Forest, it was nearby, near the Placerius Quarry, where dozens of Placerius specimens have been found. Placerius being a large synapsid, which means it's closer related to mammals than reptiles, which was one of the dominant herbivores during this time period. However, this animal was also an herbivore, and since it's the first time we found it, doesn't seem to have been as dominant but some of its other features make it very, very interesting. Symptomi prosopis sucororum is a new species of archosauriform. And I say archosauriform because it hasn't been distinctly placed in a single group, but it seems like it was much more closely related to crocodiliforms than it was to dinosaurs, with both of those being included within archosauriforms. Now, all that said, it was still very different from any other archosauriform that we know of during this time period, because it had a very short face. And that doesn't seem that interesting, but I mean very, very short. This actually made it convergent with some later crocodilians during the Cretaceous, so many, many millions of years later, such as Simosuchus, which is believed to have been herbivorous. In fact, it also had some altering teeth, which while Simosuchus didn't have different kinds of teeth, some other crocodilians did evolve different kinds of teeth, and many of those are believed to have been herbivorous or at least omnivorous. So it's very likely that Syntomi prosopis was doing something similar, either being omnivorous or even entirely herbivorous. And there were a few crocodiliforms during this time period which were herbivorous, for example, the Aedosuchians, although Syntomi prosopis doesn't seem to have quite those same adaptations to be one of those. And I say that because Syntomi prosopis has kind of a hodgepodge of different features that make it really hard to place. Some features are more crocodile-like, and some are more non-crocodile-like. For example, there's not a depression in the basio-occipital bone, which makes it less croc-like. However, it also has a small crest made by the fused parietal bones, which makes it more croc-like. What this really means is we need to find more of this animal, because it could have a lot of very important implications for the evolution and diversification of the crocodiliforms, at least early on. And hopefully we will find more of this because again, this is a quarry that's been well studied. So also finding something as totally unique as this animal is pretty unexpected and really goes to show how if you're looking even in places where fossils have already been found and well documented, you still might come up with something new. And moving much closer to the present day, if I say proboscideans, you may think of elephants such as the Asian or African elephants. And you might even think of things like mammoths but you will not think of animals like this. And that's because, unlike in the fossil record, we do not have a lot of diversity in the proboscideans, which is essentially elephants and their relatives. Instead, we have the Asian elephant and we have the African elephants. So really not a very diverse group there. Meanwhile, if you look in the fossil record, you have things like the dinotheres, but also gomphotheres and even the stegomastodons. This paper sought to look at the broad history of this entire group and try and put their diversification and extinctions into context so that they can hopefully be compared to other groups in the future. And they found quite a few different things. For example, the proboscideans migrated to North America during the Miocene across the Bering Land Bridge. And once they were there, they actually evolved quite a bit, diversifying into the gomphotheres, but also the amabilodontids. Of course, neither of these two groups actually made it into the modern day, and 
many other groups also didn't make it into the modern day, so it's not limiting it to just those ones. And there were many different events that actually caused this. The first seems to be during the late Miocene and into the Pliocene when the Ice Ages started. And this would have cut back on a lot of the different environments that these animals would have been living in, and then caused their extinction from that environmental collapse. Although some did live into the Ice Ages. The next event came about 3 million years ago, and it's not entirely sure what caused it, but there was a major loss in diversity. This actually didn't affect Africa until about 2.4 million years ago, and Africa is where the proboscideans got their start, so it does make sense that they'd be most adapted for those conditions. So whatever changed globally didn't affect Africa until later. And then there was still some moderate diversity, including things like the mammoths. Of course, hunting by humans and the end of the Ice Ages pretty much led to the extinction of most of the rest of those groups, leaving us with the very limited diversity that we have today which is really odd considering just how diverse they used to be. I mean, there were all these different, slightly different forms, but today we have very little, which is really unfortunate from an evolutionary and biodiversity perspective. It would have been really nice if some of those did survive to the modern day. One of the reasons it would have been good to have these animals survive until the modern day is so that we could actually see what they ate, and it's kind of hard to tell what animals ate in the fossil record. I mean, unless you have direct evidence like the animal that it ate inside its ribcage, it's pretty hard to tell other than judging by the shape of teeth. And some animals don't really have teeth, for example, the birds. And while some people might say it's not important to know exactly what an animal ate, in the case of the birds, it is for understanding their evolution, because the evolution of flight in the birds may be connected to their diet. And so these authors sought to set out essentially a guideline for different bird species, or at least fossil bird species, to be tested to understand what they most likely ate. And they tested many, many different metrics to try and understand what these animals ate. The first set of metrics has all to do with direct evidence. So for example, if you find a fossil of an animal and it has something like a lizard in its stomach, you know it ate lizards. Really, really good metric, very unambiguous. However, then you can also look at things like microwear on the teeth if that early bird did have teeth. And some of them did, some of them didn't. Essentially, when an animal eats something, whatever it's eating will scratch the teeth in different ways. And by studying those scratches, you can actually understand what it was eating. So that's the second direct evidence method. The final direct evidence method is by essentially looking at either coprolites, so fossilized poop, or regurgitates, so fossilized vomit. And if you see things like the bones of a lizard inside the coprolite, it probably ate that lizard. It's a, again, a very unambiguous metric. And while I said the other one was the final hard evidence metric, there is another, but it's somewhat rare because it has to do with soft tissue preservation. So essentially the preservation of the animal's beak. And as you can see in this toucan's beak with the skull, both without the beak on and with the beak on, the beak can entirely change the shape of the animal's mouth. So if that is preserved, you can actually get some direct evidence. If that's not preserved, it's really hard to get that evidence. So that one only exists in rare cases, so we're gonna move on now to the more implied lines of evidence, where there's good reason to believe that it probably would have eaten a specific subject, but it's really hard to tell because there's not that direct evidence. And so there's many different features that can try and lead into this. For example, body size. Essentially, sparrows eat very small things, such as insects or even seeds. Whereas larger birds, such as the raptors, like a golden eagle, for example, eats more vertebrate material. It is a much more aggressive feeder that's going to feed on other animals. You can also do chemical analyses on the dentine of teeth of animals, if they do have teeth, which many birds don't again, and that can help you understand what they were eating based on how dense those teeth are. Additionally, you can look at other morphometrics of these animals. For example, what was the beak shape? Because even some raptors do start to show some of that pointed beak but also they have large talons, which is a really good indicator that they probably catch large prey. So that's another one of those morphometrics you can apply to try and understand what an animal was eating. And there's some subcategories of these that they break down into greater detail, but they don't just leave it there because they actually do test it on a golden eagle. And by putting the golden eagle into this matrix, they were able to go, yeah, this works for at least this animal. And I imagine it'll be tested on more modern birds even today. With the golden eagle test, you can actually see where they had to remove all of the teeth stuff because it doesn't work because golden eagles don't have any teeth. But the talons were seen as morphometrically significant, and the mechanics of the jaws, so another morphometric measurement, 
shows adaptations for predation because it could bite hard enough to actually try and prey on something else. The mass also means it's large enough to capture prey that's large enough to sustain the animal. All that together means that this is a very good framework to start applying to other fossils so we can try and understand what the diets of the first birds actually were. As opposed to just kind of guessing based on a few isolated ideas, we actually have a concrete methodology to try and apply this in the future. And that's a very important part of paleontology is essentially setting up these frameworks to test ideas in the future. And finally, one of the papers that I think might actually be one of the more important ones that's kind of underrepresented is about paleontoethics. And that's a new term that is brought up, but it essentially deals with the ethics of paleontology. And that's a very important thing because there's been a lot of debate about this recently within the field. Now, a lot of this has to do with things like the Burmese amber, where there's really, really incredible fossils coming from it. But also, it's basically dug out of slave labor and also widespread human rights violations by the Myanmar government. So it's really not a great thing to study because you're implicitly supporting those ideologies. That said, there's still more growing concerns that we should have. For example, in human evolution, there is a growing conflict in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, which is right next to the Afar region where many early hominin fossils come from. So there's more happening there as well as the repatriation. So essentially sending back fossils that are from other countries that are housed elsewhere. For example, Ubi Rajara was smuggled out of Brazil during the 90s, and the laws in Brazil specifically state, hey, don't do this. So it was smuggled, not just taken out. So these are just some examples of why we need to actually start repairing these fossil-based injustices so that the people from these countries can actually start becoming more involved in the research that is occurring on fossils from those countries. A good example of these kind of ethics being applied, not in paleontology, but in geology, actually comes from Bolivia where the indigenous people of Bolivia were given control of lithium mines in that country. And this then meant that they were able to raise themselves out of poverty on a much broader scale than previously. So by applying this same kind of logic to paleontology, by correcting some of these injustices against marginalized groups, we can actually have a more cohesive unit within the paleontology community for research, where different researchers can actually come from anywhere. Rather than being isolated to just a few wealthy countries, we can actually have a broader system that supports all paleontologists and all people who are interested in the natural sciences. In fact, the authors go on to define the entire term of paleontoethics, stating that it is the branch of geoethics that consists of research and reflection on the values that underpin a correct behavior and practice while collecting, handling, researching, and exhibiting fossils. Paleontoethics promotes the analysis of ethical problems and dilemmas that arise in different geological, economical, and cultural contexts, which affect the management, conservation, and popularization of fossils. Which is to say that, like the last paper set up a framework for studying bird diets, this paper is trying to set up a framework with which to discuss some of these ethical issues. And they go into certain things, such as the cultural implications of some of these geologic formations. For some simple examples of the cultural importance of rocks and different geologic features, you need to understand that the Swiss would not be the Swiss without the Alps. But also, the tribes of the Colorado Plateau, such as the Navajo, would not be the Navajo without the Colorado Plateau rocks. So the Colorado Plateau is a large geologic feature that was uplifted and contains many, many fossil-bearing units. So understanding how these tribes and different peoples actually interacted with the rocks that are around them is very important for understanding how we can actually go forward in the future to help promote geologic awareness and help promote the idea that paleontologists really can come from anywhere. It's not limited to just white guys like me. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you're one of the new people who's been brought in for the Paleo Rewind, it's good to see you here. Feel free to subscribe and whatnot. I do do separate monthly reviews that go into shallower detail but hit on some much more niche topics like brachiopods. I also discussed some stranger fossils that do exist. So if you're interested in those, feel free to check them out. Additionally, we do have a Patreon where you can help support the channel and you do get to vote on some of those extra videos. We also do have some great designs, at least I will say they're great designs because my wife designed them that are on our Redbubble store. So if you're interested in paleontology shirts or stickers or something, feel free to check that out. Link will be in the doobly-doo. And as for the later half of July for the Paleo Rewind, that will be taken care of by my friends 
Alb and Joan over on Through Time and Clades. So feel free to check that out. It should be coming out just a bit after this video, I think about two hours or so. And they're great people. So yeah, check that out. With all of that in mind, everyone, please be safe. Take care. Keep wearing your mask. Get vaccinated if you're not. And don't go extinct.